I want to talk about puppy evaluation, which is why we're really all here. Uh, puppy evaluation, again, when you start and you breed your litter, what is your goal? You know, as a breeder, your goal should be to keep what's going to contribute to your breeding program. You do, of course, want to keep the big winner. Everyone does. But maybe at that time in your life, at that time, there's different ways to do things. At that time in your life, maybe you need another really nice brood bitch or something to go forward with. So first and foremost, when you evaluate puppies, look at them from the, poten the potential, uh, how they will contribute to your breeding program. Because after all, that's what a dog show is really supposed to be. It's not supposed to be about who can win the most ribbons. It's supposed to be about our breeding stock <coughs> for the future of the breed and what dogs can contribute to our breed. That's why people initially started showing dogs, to compare breeding stock. So when you start out, uh, ask yourself what it is you're going to look for in your own litter and be sure about that. Number two, know your pedigree. It's really, really, really important. I can't emphasize that enough. Now we have so many to choose from. Initially, 20 years ago, uh, when I started, most of the dogs in the United States were of American or English descent. It was a little bit of European, but nowhere near the percentage that we have and we see in the rings here today. And puppies from different bloodlines really do develop in a very different way. Uh, sometimes you will see a cute American puppy at, uh, and I want to say, let's just go back and say from a cox bred pedigree, a cobby, cute little fawn, 12 weeks old, to die for, a little short back, adorable, you think, oh my God, I've died and gone to heaven. And by the time it's nine months, it looks like something, someone hit it on the head with a cricket bat, and it can't walk, and it's gasping for air. You might see a puppy of European breeding that may be a little heavier boned, a little bit longer, maybe the head isn't quite developed, but at two years old, maybe at 10 years old, that's gonna be the better dog. So really studying the pedigrees that your dogs are from is a huge help. If you don't know who, what is behind your own pedigree, find someone who does. There's lots of resources. Find, find people who understand the pedigree or are willing to help you. And it's always good to have two or three people come and look at a litter, just if nothing else, to confirm your own opinion or not. Everyone looks at them with a different eye. So, you know, that's really, it's really, really so important about the pedigree. And as far as, you know, some people, you'll hear a lot of breeding lectures, phenotype versus genotype, yada, 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 mine's bad, this, blah, blah. Look, as far as I'm concerned, it's both. I take two dogs, if I like the look of them, I breed them together. I don't care how many times, you know, Uncle Johnny of White Hill is in the pedigree 20 years ago, the dogs that are going to contribute to your dog, the way your dog looks, are his immediate parents and grandparents. Those are the most important. I'm not saying that another prepotent dog that's in the pedigree will not contribute down the line, but those are the most important dogs. And look at the two dogs in front of you, and don't make an excuse for it. Just because Tiddles has 20 lines to Omar de la Perur, and she's still four feet long, okay? So that's great. And, attach Omar's picture to her butt, but it's not going to be Omar. So be honest with yourself. Be realistic with yourself. You know, we all, we all want to fool ourselves sometimes. We all have litters where we think, oh God, what happened? The problem is, by the time we figure that out, now we put it on Facebook from the day that we're born. And they're nursing and they're suckling. Oh, we're so excited. We can't wait to see you all at nationals. And then a month later, it's like, Crickets like chirping, what happened? Before that never really happened. I've had litters that I planned that did not turn out and uh, I was so surprised. The very first litter uh, that I bred from champion Fable Half Flower Power, who's a very beautiful bitch, I bred her to her half brother, who was a very, very beautiful dog. Uh, he was an outcross though, he had an English mother, and if you'd seen the two of these dogs together side by side, remember Lena? you would have thought there was going to be a litter of superstars. Mm -hmm. So here I am, patiently wondering where I'm going to put those best in show residents, and these babies are born. You've never seen two uglier puppies in your entire life. <laughs> First of all, I thought they were blue, and that's before I knew what blue really was. 
And I called Jan Greeley in a horrifying state of affairs, probably in the middle of the night, and said, oh my God, I think I have blue puppies. <laughs> now, had that been 10 years later, I could have said, we are so proud to announce we have rare blue baby puppies starting at $15,000. Quickly, run to the nearest device and call me now. So, you know, things have changed. Of course, they weren't blue. Uh, they were a very sort of funny chocolatey color that, uh, maybe that's mouse, but in some of the English signs, that color even rarer than blue. And now we have Sable and Merle, my personal favorite. But um, it's so nice to look into two eyes of a different color and try to think what they're thinking. So, you know, um, that uh, things don't always work out is what I'm saying. And when they don't work out, admit it to yourself. Yes. But preferably don't show it to all your friends in the rest of the world first. It's not going to work. And don't do it again. You can learn from that. You sometimes can learn so much more. And the second time I bred Lily, I bred her to a Fable House Magic Marker, who was primarily a Cox a bred. He came down from a very famous dog called Cox's Good Time Make His Mark, who was a dog that wasn't at public stud, but was a very, very good producing dog and produced some beautiful dogs and left an impact in the breed. And in her second litter, she had five puppies and they all finished by the time they were 18 months. So it was so different, just that one step away, how that can make, and that's a learning, that's a learning curve. Sometimes it's a disappointing learning curve because of course you want to have the very best ones. Um, so be, be honest with yourself and, and be critical. It's really the only way. You don't have to tell everybody you don't like your own puppies, but you can be critical to yourself and honest to yourself and say, look, this might be a great junior's dog. I could certainly finish this dog. Someone calls you and they say, I might like to start showing. This would be a wonderful puppy to do that with because that puppy can go out, it can represent you. It's not going to be the top special maybe you thought it was, but it's still a nice representation of the breed. But be, be honest with yourself. Um, when I start to evaluate a puppy, um, really I start with the basics. I hear people say all the time, you know, you ask different breeders, well, how do you pick your puppy? Oh, I pick it when it's wet. <laughs> well, the new version of that is I pick it from the ultrasound. Uh, but really, you pick it when it's wet. Really, you can't see its construction. You can't see it stand on four legs. You can't see it move. You can't see how those parts are going to go together. So the person who can pick them when they're wet, call me, call me. I got a bridge to sell you. I like to look at puppies, start to look at them only, and people who co-breed with me will know this. When they're eight to 12 weeks old, my ideal time, I start to look at them when they're about six weeks. They're up on their feet, they're tiddling around, they're starting to develop their own little personality, personalities and their own temperament. And temperament's something that we'll talk about a little bit because it's so important, no matter how beautiful they are. Sometimes the more, most beautiful puppy you ever saw is disappointingly uninterested in showing, and there's nothing that you can do about that, no matter how many times you throw cheese in the air and catch it yourself. So, um, you know, I like to look at them around six weeks old, but I like to really start to evaluate them when they are eight to 10 weeks. At that point in time, they're up enough on their feet, they're weaned, or should be, uh, unless they were bred by Khloe Kardashian. And otherwise, they're moving around. You can start to see outline, top line, and also temperament. That's when you start to see the puppy that's very outgoing, the puppy that's inquisitive, or the puppy that wants to sit in the corner and isn't quite sure. Of course, the most beautiful one. And that is really when you get an idea. I usually make my final decision about, about which puppies are show versus companion babies at eight to 10 weeks, really, closer to the 10 weeks. If you're not sure, keep them, keep them. You know, you've gone through, people sometimes sell puppies too quickly, they let them go too quickly. Um, and then they're sorry afterwards. You know, it's almost easier to have two puppies to run on together. Keep them an extra month. You know, you'll always be able to find a good home for a companion baby. And you know, if you can't, you can dye it blue. 
So, <laughs> one way or another. So keep the babies that you're really interested in and give them a chance to grow up. Um, I had some pictures I'm going to start. I don't know how these are going to go. This puppy is um, about, I believe, about eight weeks old. But at eight weeks old, you know, I'm looking already uh, at for, uh, for the head and for the ear placement and for some basic construction. I don't expect everything to be perfect. I do want to see at this age, you can already see the shape of the head, the squareness of the head, and you can see that you want that nose rope and that lay back the position of the nose, the eyes, and the set of the ears already. Some puppies with really large ears, it takes longer for their ears to come up and you have to be aware of that. You can see the bone, if a puppy has bone at this age, and you can start to see whether or not the puppy has rib spring and any kind of shape. These puppies are eight weeks old. This is, um, this is Brew and Fanny, champion Robable Fable Half Arm on Fire and champion uh, Robable Fable Half Fan Flames when they were eight weeks old. Oh and you know, you can see being primarily Euro of European, reading European descent, I mean, you can't really see it here, but they have very heavy bone. You can see the nose rope over here. You can already see the under jaw. You can see the ear set. You can see the eyes. You can start to see the shape of the body. So, you know, I always say there's no such thing as a fat Frenchie puppy. I like them to be as fat as possible. They can lose that as they get older, but I love to see a nice, solid, chunky baby. This puppy is nine weeks old here. And this puppy is a son of, uh, of Fanny also. But you can see already the outline, the shape. You can see the bone. You can see the head. What you can't see is the movement. And you don't know how they're going to develop from there. But at this age, that you know, you can see the details enough to know whether or not you want to keep that puppy or sell it. This puppy is 10 weeks old. And the reason that I showed this puppy is, does anyone know who this is? Anyone have any idea who this is? Who said that? Me. I How do you know? <laughs> yeah, that is Robable, champion Robable, uh, St. Elmo's Fire. That's Elmo. And the reason I use this picture is because at this age, if you look at him, his balance, his proportion, he looks a little bit flat maybe on his top line. And you, this is you know, something that you look for, the development of the top line. Do you have the other picture of him? And um, I think I have a picture of him as an adult, because he has a very good top line. Um, there he is, winning the top 20, or he was winning the top 20. But you can see how his top line ended up. So he did look a little bit on the flatter side. And this is where it comes to knowing, again, I go back to your bloodlines, and knowing how your bloodline is going to develop. Will the top line come in a little bit later on this line? Will the movement get better? And, and this is where all of the homework that you do as a breeder before you have a litter is really going to be helpful to you when you do have a litter. So um, this puppy, does anyone know who this puppy is? No, it's not Brew. Dream, dream. It's Dream, yes. This is Perry Payson's bitch that won the specialty from the classes in Atlanta. And she is probably about, I think, 11, 10, 11 weeks old here. And she really grew up to be pretty much like what she looks like in that picture. She didn't really change that much. But again, with the European puppy, you very often see heavy, heavy bone at an early age. But I also do want to see a little bit of neck I don't, I mean, sometimes a puppy, when you stand it up and it looks short and hobby, it might look nice now, but if there's not enough neck, and I'm not saying a Frenchie should have a long neck, but they need to be able to lift their head up. So, you know, they want to be able to look at you without choking. So it's nice to see a little bit of neck uh, there. And of course, I'm a great uh, believer in, when I look at my puppies running around, I'm always looking over the top of them to see if they have the correct shape, if they're pear-shaped, if they're a little too big, if they're slab-sided, because the shape is very, very important. It's what, to me, it's what defines a friendship. The bite at this age, uh, for me, I try to look uh, for a bite at eight to 10 weeks that is either level or just undershot, preferably just undershot. If they are too undershot at that age, 
And this is a trick, you know, here's the trick. We want that pretty beautiful upsweep of under jaw that gives that beautiful Frenchy expression that we're actually losing a lot of around the world. And getting it sometimes, you need, of course, them to be undershot enough in order to achieve it. But just a little bit too much, and then you have teeth or tongue and it's destroyed. But you still need it. So I look for a baby that has good placement of teeth, uh, certainly the mouth is not wry, but just undershot to allow time for that jaw to continue to grow as the baby gets older and hopefully give you that pretty upsweep of jaw that you like. A puppy that is more undershot than, I'm going to say, a quarter of an inch, I would really have a big concern about as an adult. That's not to say that it couldn't come right, but it gives me an indication that puppy's going to start to look maybe a little bit more shovel jawed to narrow through here, and then of course as the puppy gets older, teeth and tongue begin to show or can show, which is a bad fall. Uh, movement, in terms of movement, um, it's very, you know, you can assess if babies are, they're roly-poly babies. Oh, this type of here was probably more in the seven to eight week age range, but you can even see just as the puppy's sitting, you can see the front. You can see there's good width between the front, you can see the legs are straight. Those are the things that, I, that I'm looking for. If you f see a puppy at eight to 10 weeks old and it has already a very narrow front, then it's, you know, it's not good. You, th they can't really be chunky enough, or wide enough, short enough at that age, because as they grow, they are going to, they are going to change, they're gonna change shape.